This is uh, Speaking Freely. I'm Floyd Abrams, and we are really honored today to have Lee Bollinger, the president of Columbia University, to uh, sit and chat with me about some issues, uh, First Amendment and otherwise, uh, of uh, great importance. I'm not sure if we first met when you were the dean uh, at the law school at the University of Michigan, but that's that's what I that's yeah. what I recall. Yeah. And uh, after that, you were the president of the University of Michigan. Now, for the last 23 years, president uh, at Columbia University. Uh, yeah, 20. 20. Ah. Yeah. It's, does it feel like 23 here? <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I, I could go with 30 yeah. if you wanted. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, so I thought we'd start uh, not on a First Amendment issue, but on uh, affirmative action. Uh, you were the named defendant uh, in the mm -hmm. two cases that the Supreme Court has already uh, decided in this area. And there are, of course, mm -hmm. cases coming up now from Harvard and the University of North Carolina. Uh, with all your experience in this area, what what is what is your view about the the value, the benefits, and any downside of uh, affirmative action in higher education? Mm -hmm. Well, so this is a very, very big subject and something uh, that I uh, care a great deal about, been deeply involved with, as you've said. So I think the, um, uh, what I'm going to say, Jeff Stone and I, you're, of course, good friend and my good friend, uh, we have a number of projects together and we have one uh, we've just now completed on the rationale for uh, affirmative action, <clears throat> the constitutional rationale. And that book uh, will come out uh, in the latter part of this year, early in 23. And uh, the case that I have made in, uh, over the past 25 years and the, the case we make in the book uh, is that America has uh, a long, long, uh, history of really incredible, invidious discrimination against African Americans, uh, against black citizens, American citizens. And that, of course, was the uh, subject of the great case of Brown and all the cases and the, the legislation that happened in the 1960s. In the 1970s, higher education all across the country realized that uh, this persistent discrimination required uh, these universities and colleges to add, make sure that within our student bodies and our faculty, but especially within student bodies, there was uh, racial uh, diversity. And over this period of time, um, I think it's been very, very successful as one part of the effort uh, to overcome not only the past discrimination, but the ongoing discrimination. So my uh, belief is that uh, affirmative action in higher education is rooted in a rationale, rooted in a, a, a empathetic understanding that racism uh, in America uh, cannot be overcome um, uh, in a generation or two uh, and unfortunately, it really persists. So institutions have to do what they can. Um, so I think that's the key point. I think we went off base when Justice Powell wrote in Bakke um, in the late 70s, early 80s uh, of the last century that you could not use the rationale I just articulated, that you could only use a rationale of some vague concept of educational benefits of diversity, not a societal problem of discrimination that we need to overcome. So that's my basic overall framework, Floyd, for right. thinking about affirmative action. What do you make of, I know you know the phrase very well, 
uh, Chief Justice Roberts' uh, much quoted observation, uh, the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. Uh, he's saying that, uh, I, I, I don't think I'm uh, extrapolating too much, as a way of right. saying that affirmative action by its very nature is discriminatory. Right. So I, I think that's a, a terrible error of uh, constitutional judgment, a terrible error of uh, social judgment. Uh, I think we know uh, invidious discrimination uh, when we see it. And I think we know trying to overcome invidious discrimination when we see it. Um, and there is a profound uh, difference, 180 degree difference between those two. So to label affirmative action as practiced in higher education, as practice uh, in higher education as uh, discrimination really then just takes you into the uh, discussion about what can be done in the society consistent with the Constitution and good legislative policy and good uh, civic policy across the country to try to overcome uh, this terrible legacy and ongoing practice. Uh, so I don't think labeling it as uh, invidious discrimination as he did uh, is an accurate conclusion, but I think more importantly, it doesn't really take you uh, into the discussion about what are we trying to do here. Well, we could spend our whole half hour and more, of course, on this, but uh, I did want to start out with that, but now turn to the, uh, the First Amendment. Uh, what's going on on campus these days with respect to free speech? Certainly, uh, critics uh, characterize, I'm speaking broadly, but, but they do, uh, what's going on is uh, a sort of uh, a tyranny of the left uh, and uh, a ongoing and quite deliberate effort to stifle speech uh, of people who disagree with uh, the currently received notions of social justice. We're looking at Columbia or looking more broadly where, where do, would you say we stand in terms of First Amendment on American college campuses? Yeah. Well, um, of course, talking to you, Floyd, is you know, talking to one of the icons of the First Amendment and, and uh, a great, great figure uh, and thinker and practitioner. So... Um, you know, I would welcome any um, any insights you have. My own, I, I think, is somewhat complex. Um, I think the First Amendment is basically flourishing in American society, and I think it's flourishing in uh, on American campuses. Uh, I don't, uh, you know, to say that. Uh, is to try to do two things. Put it in historical perspective, because in our lifetimes, uh, we have encountered uh, effort after effort uh, to try to suppress speech, free speech, and free press. It is a constant theme of American history, just like it is in any uh, country. Um, and we have spent our lives, you and I have, uh, trying to think about the reason, the rationales for free speech, free press, the threats to it, uh, the doctrines and principles that should be embraced, uh, the scope of the, uh, of the principles. And over the course of our lives, there has been uh, an enormous jurisprudence built up, an enormous set of norms and practices uh, at institutions and all across the society. I think um, in that really 100 year, not you and me, but the 100 year history of this effort, which begins 
as we both know, in 1919. So it's, it's pretty recent, really, what we have. We have to start from a, a, a premise of enormous pride in what has been uh, accomplished. So there's that. Uh, then there's the reality of the persistent threats to free speech um, and the underlying attitudes of intolerance that lead to suppression of free thought and free speech. That is just an ongoing reality. That's why we have a constitutional principle of free speech. So the, so I'm not, uh, I'm too experienced and too old to be too discouraged by yeah. <laughs> what I see are, you know, frequent efforts to suppress yeah. free speech. It, I'll say finally, go, go No, I, I'm just thinking back personally. Uh, when I, when I entered Cornell in 1952 as a bright young 16-year-old student, about the first thing they gave you when you showed up was an identification card on which was your name and, and your picture and uh, a, n a number of, uh, I, we would now say provocatively, but, but not then, uh, a list of things you can't do and things you couldn't say. Uh, and what I remember most about it was you have to have this card with you at all times. And if, and if we find you without it, you'll be, you'll be subject to uh, expulsion. Uh, so, so think how we've moved on. Uh, uh, right. But, uh, I mean, our students, right. I, I hate to use the cliche, but, I mean, is it your right. sense that there is more of a, quote, chilling effect, unquote, uh, on students when they uh, speak out about public issues on controversial subjects than there was uh, when you first came to Columbia, say? Yeah. So I, my view, and it's only my view and my experience on this, and of course every year I teach a First Amendment course to 150 undergraduate students, and I deal with issues on speakers and free speech on campus all the time, speak to students about it at convocation and at commencement, so I'm uh, sort of intimately involved in this. And I don't see any particular difference in the campuses today than 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. There are definitely issues to be addressed uh, about intolerance and uh, informal and formal efforts to suppress speech. I don't think it's any, uh, I don't think it's significantly worse than it has been. And my view, Floyd, is that two points I would make. One is that this is the human condition, the natural human condition of being intolerant, of having beliefs, wanting those beliefs to be universally embraced and wanting to suppress people who disagree. That's our instinct. And so this is a perpetual problem. This is an ongoing problem. And at some points in history, it's worse than at other points. Um, and I think now we, we have some significant issues on that in the society. But it's, a, it's an ongoing uh, effort to deal with the natural impulses of people. What I say is, People are not born believing in the First Amendment. I mean, that's not a natural <laughs> sort of thing. You don't find five, ten-year-olds, you know, saying that they believe in free speech. So, so I'm. Uh, I, that's my view on that. The second point is that I worry all the time about efforts to characterize universities, especially coming from the right in American political society in American politics, to criticize universities for being filled with intolerance as a way to delegitimize universities. And uh, I'm very, very uh, wary and uh, suspicious of these claims. As you look back on your tenure as president, 
and I, I don't know, the one that comes to mind, the, the most, uh, the, the, the topic and the speaker who comes to mind as the most controversial was Ahmadinejad uh, mm -hmm. uh, and the controversy that followed the uh, invitation, not from you, uh, but as I recall it, by, right. by a student group. Uh, no. lo looking back on, on yeah. that, uh, w was it yeah. a mistake, do you think, for the university uh, to have uh, allowed or chosen to permit uh, that invitation uh, by that group uh, to lead to his uh, presence on campus and him speaking on campus. Right. So just to correct one uh, factor, which I think is significant, it wasn't a student group. No. It was the dean of the School of International and Public ah. Affairs. Uh, and faculty within the, the School of International and Public Affairs. Uh, and, of course, there were student groups that um, uh, aligned with the invitation, but it was really a school that invited the speaker. Um, as president, I had no choice, uh, given the principles of free speech and academic freedom that we all embrace, to defend that decision to go move forward. Uh, whether I would have made the same decision as the dean of the School of International Public Affairs or as president of the university to invite Ahmadinejad, I think is a, you, you can make reasonable arguments on either side uh, of that. But once a school, faculty group, choose to invite a speaker uh, for academic purposes, it's my job to make sure that that's uh, carried forward. I also believe, and I know you believe this too, that if you are going to participate in free speech, if you're going to have a principle of freedom of speech and academic freedom, it is incumbent upon those who disagree with the speakers to articulate and the opposition, to speak uh, themselves. So my view was that if Ahmadinejad is going to come and speak at, um, uh, at Columbia, we have to make sure that there is a full uh, debate about ideas that he may present and views he may present. And I couldn't ask anybody else to do that. I felt I, it was my obligation uh, to, uh, to perform this free speech service. And so I did so. Um, uh, and I did it at the beginning because I worried that if we waited until questions, he would simply leave and it would have left a, a, a very bad impression on people. I believe universities are places where any speaker, basically, can legitimately be invited under academic freedom, free speech purposes to speak, provided that the the context uh, is uh, open to full debate and, and discussion. So I, I feel I have very strong views about this. And, and there are people who always want to say, by having speakers with bad ideas, you are legitimating uh, that speaker and those bad ideas. And you and I know that is always the first argument of behind censorship. Yep. It's that if you permit this to go forward, uh, you are now aligning yourself in some way, promoting the ideas, uh, 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 embracing them, uh, uh, propagating them. And if, if you accept that, there's no more free speech because uh, you just, you know, will find yourself always when a controversial speaker comes, uh, having to say no, uh, rejecting it because of that claim. So, But is there a, uh, should there be a, some sort of limit uh, based on educational principles? Uh, I mean, a racist speaker, an anti-Semitic speaker, uh, uh, should should once invited, 
what role, if any, should the president of a great institution like Columbia play uh, in responding? So, um, so my view, and I would strongly guess it's your view, that if people, there are various parts of universities. So there's the academic part and then there's the kind of public forum part. So students frequently want to invite speakers, not necessarily for academic purposes, but because they, they want to provoke debate or they want to do this or that. Uh, when a school, a dean, faculty invite speakers, it really must be for, because they're using university resources for academic purposes. Uh, it is absolutely within the bounds of, of academic inquiry to want to listen to and deal with and respond to people who have terrible ideas, uh, just ugly, awful ideas. Uh, but to engage with that uh, on a university campus or in a university absolutely should be within the bounds of, of academic inquiry. The president's role, in my view, is to defend that, to articulate the reasons for it, to um, explain it both internally and to the public, and uh, to try to ensure that there is uh, as full a debate as you can, uh, you can muster. Uh, it is on the second part, Floyd, that I think is um, uh, it, it's just really crucial that uh, that there be leadership on responding to uh, bad ideas or ideas we deeply disagree with. Uh, Robert Post, uh, who you and I both know uh, and mm -hmm. regard well, I'm sure, uh, yeah. uh, from uh, Yale Law School, has written a number of articles um, I hope I'm doing him justice now, but try, trying to cool the, the fervor for free speech or First Amendment rights on campus. Uh, I mean, if, if yeah. I can do it in a line or two for our, our listeners, it is a university is a place uh, of scholarship. A university is a place to teach. Uh, uh, it, it is not a place to... Uh, get involved in uh, uh, ongoing political, social debate. Students may do that, of course, but that, that's not a purpose. That, that's not a, that should not be a focus uh, of a university. And uh, as, as you well know, and I know, you know, he's mm -hmm. come on mm -hmm. you know, quite strongly uh, in that respect, and I'm just interested in you, your reaction to that. Yeah. So uh, you're right. I have the highest regard for Robert, and that uh, uh, sort of thesis is presented in the book you and I participated in, that Jeff and I edited the free speech century about the 100 years of the development of, um, of First Amendment jurisprudence. I My own feeling is different from Robert's. Um, I, I do... I made the distinction a moment ago, and I'll just repeat it. I think universities are two, uh, there are two parts to universities. One is the academic scholarly part, including teaching. Uh, and that has norms about it. It has uh, institutional mission uh, behind it. It uh, and everything that is done uh, within the university, in the classroom, in scholarship, um, really should conform to the uh, principles of uh, academic, uh, I, I, I call this the scholarly temperament. There are things that, that we insist on uh, that, um, that 
that both enhance certain kinds of, of ideas and speaking and limit it. So to be more, to be clear about this, people don't get tenure because they publish ordinary ideas or stupid ideas. They're denied tenure. They're, they don't get promoted. Um, we don't fund uh, research activities that are not consistent with the uh, uh, norms about what are important subjects to, to pursue. In the classroom, a teacher, a professor can't decide, uh, you know, I have my some views about this political issue, and I'm going to use this class hour to talk about those, uh, those views. So we really limit speech and we uh, enhance uh, our efforts to understand the world through scholarly norms and a scholarly temperament. So Robert is absolutely right that we uh, design universities so that they can do this thing. And, it, and it's not the open public forum. It's, it's not uh, you know, Central Park or Times Square. It's, it's different. But in, we also have a public forum on universities, which is a, a, a not insignificant part of the institution, not by any means the dominant part. And in that, we let students especially invite speakers, engage in discussion, do things that uh, are not scholarly. Uh, they're not part of the academic uh, mission, but we embrace the same free speech principles that uh, you have to if you're talking about speakers in the public square. And you don't have to do that as a private university, but we choose to do it. Uh, so we have little public forums within uh, universities. And, and um, I, I think Robert's view is you don't have to have that. It's not like that's a, a, a demand of the principle of free speech. But the fact is we do because we like to have a, a public forum within universities. So I think that you have to separate out those two things and talk about them uh, as different, uh, acting according to different principles. Let me ask you a very broad question. Uh, I I think I promised you this would be half an hour or so. Uh, looking back on your, your years uh, uh, in position of authority on university campuses, uh, have, have we been moving in the, a direction of more uh, m more free speech, uh, perhaps more uh, uh, expression of different uh, conflicting uh, views over that time? And, and what, what, what direction have we been moving in as a society uh, on, on campus uh, in terms of freedom of expression? Um. Well, uh, let me give it a shot, Floyd, and see if this is uh, responsive. So I think um, I think there is a kind of ebbing and flowing of uh, sort of major political activism on uh, American campuses. So. In the 1960s, we know it was intense, lots of political activity that uh, resulted in uh, a, a lot of debates about uh, public issues. Over the course of the next several decades, there were periods when it was low and periods when it's been high again. Uh, in the past five years, I think it's been high again. Uh, I think student concerns about climate change, uh, about racial discrimination, about other forms of discrimination uh, in the society, um, uh, about Trump, uh, about um, a whole variety of issues, has become much more intense again. 
10 years ago, 15 years ago, I think it wasn't so uh, intense. So I would say it's an ebbing and flowing and not a uh, sort of uh, sort of rise or decline. In terms of academic inquiry, I think uh, I've never been in a period of greater energy behind exploration of new science, uh, new engineering and, and social sciences, new uh, you know, ways of looking at the world, problems that uh, need to be solved. I, I think there is an extraordinary uh, drive within these institutions to expand human knowledge. I mean, at, at, at its greatest, uh, most thrilling uh, kind of role, it is um, filled with integrity and uh, I think incredibly successful. So I think universities are among our greatest, most successful, greatest success stories uh, in America. And they really are the envy of the world. And so I think we, we need to include that within the sort of overview of are they more or less um, you know, filled with freedom of thought and inquiry. And what would you say as we wind up about the country generally? I mean, we're where are we in terms of free speech uh, in America, both on the level of what the law protects and how we behave uh, as a people in terms of freedom of expression? Right. So there it's a different story. Um, so I think that uh, officially, if you look at the formal censorship of free speech. I think as I started when we began Floyd, uh, my view is uh, we're still the most, uh, we have the strongest protections of free speech and free press in the world and we have, it, it's the greatest in, in human history. I think there are various threats on the horizon from the official uh, uh, sector uh, I think both you and I have uh, concerns and worries about the Supreme Court and what it might do to certain classic doctrines uh, like New York Times versus Sullivan and um, a few other major areas. But at the formal level of First Amendment jurisprudence, I think the society is still strong. At the level of, inf of the informal, the private world, but the public uh, realm, not censorship, uh, I think there's massive uh, problems. And I think it is uh, in part uh, the result of the way in which the internet and social media platforms have evolved, uh, which I think is the, uh, you know, the, every time there's a new major uh, technology of communications that comes along, you have these periods of great disequilibrium. Uh, and we have that now uh, with the internet, how to think about it, how to structure it, how to, how institutions should behave in it. And then there's the, uh, the, the problem of the intolerance uh, within the society uh, on all sides, but especially on the right. And, and, uh, and the trend towards massive disinformation campaigns and lies and falsehoods and so on. That is a, that is a, I, I think a change of enormous consequence, uh, which of course we're seeing play out mm. every single day. Let me, uh, <laughs> one more question then. Uh, given the centrality of the internet now, given the degree to which people receive information from and participate in expressing their views uh, on the Facebooks and the like. Uh, are, are we better off 
from a First Amendment perspective and social policy perspective more broadly yeah. than we were when there were three networks uh, and fewer yeah. modes right. of communication. Right, right. So unbalanced, my answer is we are better off. Um, but uh, we are still in a process of trying to uh, adjust for the really bad uh, speech that happens uh, as aided and assisted and 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 multiplied by the the internet, especially social media platforms. So we know that you and I know you represented these people. I've served with them. You've served with them. Uh, we developed a very responsible press in American society. And the New York Times, the Washington Post, would not publish a political ad. They would choose not to publish if it contained falsehoods. We need uh, social media institutions to behave more responsibly uh, as responsible institutions within the society. And they're in the course of trying to figure out how to do that. But, you know, my view is not coming, it's not coming fast enough. Jeff and I, Jeff Stone and I, have another project which will come out, a book at the, in August, on this problem, on social media and uh, regulations uh, and the threats to democracy. You and I <laughs> lived through an era when there were really two different kinds of approaches to freedom of the press. There was the print media approach, the New York Times, Washington Post, and the broadcast media uh, of television and radio. And one was completely free and developed its own standards, and the other one was regulated uh, according to the public interest. Uh, so I'm, I, I'm not saying that is the model exactly, but it's not as if we haven't been here um, before. Yes. And so we need to uh, right. we need to think about what it means. Right. Lee, thank you so much. Uh, I thank you. I know how busy you are, and I appreciate both your friendship and thank your you doing this today. Thanks a lot. 